pretty much towards Hudson Bay and the Great Lakes area seems to be where these markers are most abundant. So we think there were air bursts that were heaviest over that part of the ice sheet. Now if it did, what would have happened to the ice sheet? So imagine huge explosions in the air, possibly things hitting the ground. What's that going to do when it smashes into ice? And is there any evidence that anything did happen to it? Well, here's what it looked like before 13,000 years ago. There was a chain of glacial lakes along the edge of the, um, of the ice sheet, and they all drained <clears throat> down the Mississippi into the Gulf. But then suddenly, 12,900 years ago, the drainage was diverted. It was just like shutting a faucet off, nothing going down the Mississippi. And the Mississippi, prior to that, had been a raging river. You would not recognize it. You know, the old, slow, muddy river you see today, this was a wild river that was lethal. Uh, meltwater was roaring down. It was miles wide in many places, uh, miles wider than it is today. And then all of a sudden, it shut down, and, and the water started to go out to the east. So you see two ways it went. And it also went out through uh, Hudson Strait began to flow out through the Arctic, began to flow uh, between Europe and Greenland, on into the North Atlantic and off of Greenland itself, <clears throat> and it flowed right into the North Atlantic, previously into the Gulf, now suddenly into the North Atlantic, and it caused a whole lot of trouble when it did that. <clears throat> so the meltwater basically halted the circulation of the ocean. Uh, you've all heard of the Gulf Stream, right? Uh, that's part of that huge ocean conveyor that sweeps warm water up into the North Atlantic and takes it over by Europe. And uh, because of that, Europe has a pretty nice climate. Uh, when that conveyor is not flowing, it gets really cold. Uh, let's take a look. In fact, here's the conveyor itself. And this is, uh, when it's working, this is the way it, it works. It sweeps up from the south. And, goes in a circuit, drops back down, and goes all the way around the planet. Well, suddenly, here's what happened 12,900 years ago. Fresh water and icebergs flooded into the North Atlantic. And when it did, it shut down the conveyor. So the conveyor stopped at about the equator, somewhere in there, and started looping back. And no more radiator running into the North Atlantic. When it did, it got very cold in North America and cold in Europe, and that's what we call the Younger Dryas. And it's well known from the studies that that's exactly what happened. This is not part of our hypothesis. It's been studied for many decades. That conveyor shut off, and it shut off. And when it did, because it has a lot of feedback mechanisms that keep it, it's a little like an ocean liner. When when an ocean liner, it's hard to get started, and once it's started, it's hard to stop. Well, that's what happens. Once the conveyor shuts off, and it takes a lot of energy to finally get it moving again, and it stayed off for a thousand years, and that was the period that we call the Younger Dryas. After that, the conveyor started up again, and then got warmer. That's, we've been living in that age, the Holocene, ever since then. Well, let's take a closer look at the ice sheet. This is what scientists uh, who uh, study the ice uh, figure the approximate shape of it was 14,000 years ago. And this is uh, based on a theory called rebound. The idea is that when you stack miles and miles of ice above the, the crust, it's going to push the crust down. And uh, just like you fill up a boat, the boat's going to ride over in the water. Well, it happens to the continent, too. That downward pressure led to there being a three kilometer thick ridge right across the middle of Canada. So that was 14,000 years ago, and here's what it looked like a few thousand years later. You see it's broken up into two high ridges with a big low in the middle, which we call Hudson Bay. So now is this just normal part of the, the melting of the glacier? Most people think it is. But is it possible that it's related to the impact? We already know that all of our markers point towards central Canada as being where the heaviest part of the bombardment took <coughs> place. And here's another clue that seems to connect them. Let's take a look. And here's, um, this is based on a study by a number of um, oceanographers. They drilled a whole lot of cores into the North Atlantic and uh, all around the edge of Canada, as far away as Bermuda. <coughs> 
all the way across the Atlantic, almost to Ireland and to uh, Africa. And what they found in every one of those cores was a 12,900-year-old layer of carbonate, limestone, dolomite. So it was 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters thick in uh, Bermuda, 10 off Ireland, and it was um, 6 meters thick and um, just off the mouth of Hudson Strait. And when, so how to get there and what does it mean seems odd, but um, there are some clues when they looked at the source of the carbonate. What they found was that it matches Hudson Bay, matches Hudson Strait, where there are known outcrops of limestone and dolomite, and um, all along eastern Canada. So the geochemistry tells them that, that all of that carbonate came from Canada. So, well, how to get off the um, coast of Ireland? Well, icebergs. Now, icebergs block the debris when they go across the continental sheet. They will freeze all of the ground up rock into the bottom of the iceberg. And when the iceberg floats out across and it melts, and it releases all that and trickles down to the bottom of the ocean where people who drill the cores find it. So imagine an iceberg floating across the Atlantic, slowly dropping this trail of carbonate to the bottom of the ocean. And there's more of it near Canada and less of it near Ireland. Well, what that tells us is that there was a huge armada of icebergs that just filled the North Atlantic. And you would not have been able to sail across it in a boat today. Do you think the Titanic was in for trouble? You would have never been out of sight of massive icebergs. And um, of course, uh, and when you put them in your drink, it, it's cold, and it did the same thing to the North Atlantic. That fresh water made a cap and it shut down the conveyor. And it started at 12,900 years ago, lasts for a thousand years. And here's our link to, to the impact. The collapse, what they know from the cores, dating the cores, the collapse began 12,900 years ago. And so we think that the event, the ET event, <coughs> caused that collapse. Um, here's the impact and the ice sheet. You take a look, there's a, we even have a site that makes a connection. This is Lake Agassiz, a huge lake bigger than several states, two times bigger than the Great Lakes. And this is the little little baby lake next to it. It wasn't very big, but both of them were dammed by ice, not by debris, but by ice. And the dam failures and the subsequent drainage of those lakes in the North Atlantic is one of the triggers of the underclass. So this is what uh, Lake Hunting might have looked like. It had ice up to the margin of it. It was an actual sediment profile. It was a deep water environment prior to 12,900 years ago. And right at 12.8, 12.9, the ice dam collapsed. Thousand cubic kilometers of ice of water flowed out of the lake and it drained from a deep water environment to a shallow water environment. And that happened right at the time of the event. Oddly enough, there is a black map in this uh, layer, just like you see at Murray Springs. He's a polymath. And above it, <laughs> it gradually filled in with other sediment. And, um, and it was a prairie by Folsom time, so the lake had